custom games and see what happens. Why is my microphone quiet again? That's a bit of a yikes. Every day my microphone seems to just reset its sound. This is a team league, basically. If you want to know what it's about, then I'd suggest you check the bracket button. Um, and it'll tell you. I'm just going to focus on games. I'm kind of just done today. What's up, hello, Zergen? Thank you so much for the 300 bits. Appreciate it. Our first match of this today will be from the winner bracket semi-finals. Our red Terran player representing Bjorn and the kids, which is Bjorn, Patience, and himself, is Gumiho. Up against the blue Zerg bottom right hand side representing the Innovation one-man team, which is also made up of Zest and himself, Sue. We have ourselves, our blue Zerg Sue, setting up into a very aggressive Roach-based attack in the very early stages of the game. Overlord heading across towards the upper left-hand side. A couple of lings on the way out, and we are going to be seeing Gumiho. Well, of course, doesn't really know about this just yet. It's kind of interesting to see like a, ro a Ravager rush like this on Parasite, because it is such a large map. It is so difficult to move across this map. So it, it definitely becomes a little bit d tough, a little bit dangerous, but we'll see what Sue can get up to here and see how much he can get done. I mean, it might just work because Gumiho will skip things, such as the SCV scout, not expecting a pool first to be an issue. He actually skips the Reaper, so he's going to have zero information at all about this. As we do see that first Marine pops out and down to the low ground. I mean, Factory comes down a second. Uh, reactor will probably come down as well, which means we are really kind of just unitless at the moment. So, Gumiho is not very well set up, but of course you are going to benefit Gumiho from the fact that Sue will take a long time to cross the map, and that does give you a bit more time to prepare, or to at least have some unit production rolling. You would generally imagine here that we're, oh, he's building a tech lab as well. Like, if he'd reacted out like uh, Cyclones, this becomes a, mo a lot more manageable. But with a tech lab, I guess the Marauder does pretty okay against the Roaches, but this will be a lot of Ravages. Well, he actually brings a factory towards a, uh, huh, he actually brings a factory towards the tech lab. Or is he going to build a starport on the tech lab? Well, that could be a very fast Banshee, which could also work against this. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling it a little bit. Very fast uh, tech lab ba uh, starport, a very fast, fast Banshee. So I'm going to pull away here, as we're just going to be seeing that Marine chasing that Ling down. A couple more Ravagers coming up, and they're going to clean this Marine out. So Marine will fall, as we do see these couple of units. Well, I'd immediately, I mean, just cancel on the CC. Can't blame Gumiho for that, because how on earth is he meant to hold the low ground? He has a Hellion right now, an SCV as well. It's not a ton of uh, Ravagers just yet. The Corrosive Bile hits a few in the back, though, and that's already quite painful. Obviously, time is passing by, but time is also ticking for Sue here, because with this Tech Lab finishing, now we see this Banshee on the way up, and that Banshee is a huge part of this defense because there is nothing to shut down a Banshee apart from very, very fortunate Corrosive Files where the Terran player will not be paying attention. Obviously, you're not expecting the Terran player not to be paying attention in this situation. So, well, the Banshee on its way. The Cyclone will help to shut this down just a little bit. There is more units being made here by Sue, who is still yet to expand at home. Only on 13 drones of 12, 13 workers killed and counting. I mean the more damage done now, the better it is for transitioning, but transitioning is still going to be difficult anyways. Corrosive Files forcing the SCVs away, stop and repair for just a moment here. Next Ravager now will go down, Corrosive Files pushing this back again, Cyclone falls, but now the Banshee is about to pop. Man, this has felt like the slowest Banshee build time of all time. There's going to be seeing another road shows up, and just trying to pick up the last few couple of kills here before all is done and dusted. This one road will go for a couple of SCVs on the low ground. There is some now one hittable. If he target fires correctly, he got one of them. As we do see in the end, it's 18 workers killed, 10 SCVs remaining from Gumiho on the map, 13 drones remaining from Sue, and our army supply favorable for Sue as well. Banshee takes down the Roach. It's going to kill him down towards the bottom right hand side. Marine going to fight against this overload. A couple more Ravages heading towards the upper left. And, well, I mean, that's actually kind of nice here because this Banshee is obviously off across the map. I wonder what he can actually do, though. Maybe he actually cancels Cloak. That'd be kind of huge. Cancels Cloak anyways and starts up another Banshee. Is this Banshee? Oh, my God, it turns around. That buys Sue so much time to get another Queen up, maybe get a Spore Crawler ready, maybe even start building the Natural. And, of course, it means that these Ravages are probably going to be able to get rid of a few more of these SCVs. So a few more SCVs starting to go down, and this is obviously really nice. Now this is maybe even the game changer. 
because this is six extra workers we're talking about here. This is Cloak not on the Banshee, so these queens can fight them wh wherever. Man, all of this is actually kind of sick now. This Gummy Ho is also being stopped from mining in the main base with the workers that he does have. And the Sue is just rather happily going up into a natural expansion here. That is seven workers killed on the bonus attack. And that means that overall in this game, 25 SCVs have gone down. It's going to be seen as Star Pole going to lift up, move to the side. Factory moves over to the side as well. And we're just going to be seeing an Overlord into the main base. A Marine going to pop out. And a couple of drones and a Queen. Still coming in from Sue here on the bottom right. Helene gets itself stuck in a corner there, can't really do much, and it'll get taken down, I mean, in a way. <laughs> Gummy Ho can't afford to give up units, but in a way, it's also good for him to kind of see what's going on, I guess. Get a rough idea as to where Sue is at in the game. A couple of Ravages off to the left side, Overlord going to come up overhead. And we do see these two Banshees of Gummy Ho going to continue coming towards the upper left side of the map. Glare's on the way up from Sue, I mean, of course... The, just the fact these Banshees haven't even been able to get aggressive is just so amazing for Sue. I mean, these two Ravagers over here running away still alive as well. It's just been no counter pressure at all by Gumiho because he's afraid of more units running in. And that's the big issue at the moment. So we see this Marine getting rid of that Overlord right there. Lair coming up from Sue. And uh, just continuing with this. As you see, Overlord's just hanging around towards the top side of the map. Rax Factory and the Starport all side up here from Gumiho as well. Command center dropping down about halfway done. Lair's going to be finishing up very shortly. Eight more drones on the way. Link speed on its way out as well here from Sue. Couple of banshees moving out. Going to be holding the high ground vision to see this uh, marine able to take down the overlord. I mean, surely Gumiho is just going to be a massive. Uh, and a little bit of an issue right now as this overseer will start to morph in. A couple of overseers starting to morph in. Actually morphs in one on the other side, Sue, as well. I mean, I guess, again, you see the Banshees still. You don't know if they haven't rebuilt a cloak. May as well just be very safe. There's no reason to give this away right now, as we have a hatchery dropping down on the third base location as well. Two Marines here tagging on that Overseer. The couple of Banshees up in the sky. Nidus Network from Sue is obviously one of the easier ways just to end this game, because the only real defense there is is a couple of Banshees. If there's one tank, you can break through that. And he just knows that Gummy has been so far behind that it's so difficult for him to do anything that will realistically keep him alive if all of Sue's units get across the map, Queens included. Obviously, if it was just Roaches, then the Banshees have a good chance to clean it up, or they can catch the units moving across. But for Nidus Network, it's a very different set of circumstances. We do see those two Banshees start to head down towards that main base. A couple of Ravagers fighting away here. Marines taking some hits. Tank taking some shots. And we do see the Corporal Cross of Bowels landing down. As we do see the uh, Siege Tank taking a couple of shots there. So Siege Tank takes a couple of shots and we do see the Overseer getting taken down. But the fact the tank is low leading up into this uh, Nidus attack. Oh, we actually don't see the Nidus just yet from Sue. I feel like he didn't have that many units. So maybe just waiting a little bit. As we do have these two Ravagers from Sue coming up the left side. A few Marines and a tank up on the high ground. Nice SCV wants to try and start repairing. As we'll see one Ravager picked off immediately there. Still not really much. I mean... I guess, I mean, Sue can just throw down a Nidus at the front. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be in the main base. These two Banshees going to loop around in towards the natural expansion. Spore will get a shot or two. Drones will have to pull for a moment. It's mostly still just drones in production. The Nidus network now is seen. You see this Queen coming in, picks off that Banshee as well. Sue's still decided not to go and uh, kill his opponent just yet. As another Overseer now in trouble. Another Overseer will go down. Sue being a little bit reckless on the other side, but again, it's... It's rec recklessness, which really isn't going to be punished all too much. As Sue drops down a Spire, Roach Speed starts up. He's just been drawn in. He's now on 51 to 29 workers. As we're going to be seeing the couple of tanks in at the medevac moving out down the left-hand side. Roach Speed still coming in on the Roach Roar, and as we do have those Marines, the tank, still coming down the left to see just what position they can get into here. See if they can uh, do something. I mean, I mean, it's like a really, like, almost like a hopeless attack, which you just sort of hope that somehow Sue has just gone into, like, 90 drones without any units at all. And you're like, aha, I kill a base, some drones, maybe I get some momentum. Honestly, when you're relying on that, it's not, not really looking all too pretty as you see. I mean, it's going to be three tanks here. It's not a, you know, it's not nothing. But it's still not going to be a great amount either as Sue starts to press on forwards. We're going to see a couple of Corrosive Bows coming down. And Medivac gets shut down here. 
Queens are kind of confusing. And it looks as though this will be GG. Sue takes game number one of this best of seven. Again, the way this works is it is... All right. Let's do this to the top left-hand side. Our Green Protoss player representing Bion and the kids. It is Patience. And to the bottom right-hand side, we have got ourselves the pink Protoss player in the form of Zest. So yeah, Bjorn is going to be playing uh, in the next uh, game on from this, guys. And of course, we have that 2v2 coming up as well. Uh, these two players uh, were originally cast on base for TV, actually. We, uh, the whole idea that I was going to cast them was that we would cast them in like the European time zone so that you guys could watch them, even if you couldn't, you know, obviously some people like to go and watch VODs, but maybe you didn't know it was happening because it always happens through the day for you or something. So we've been casting these in the evenings and we've got... Just a few matches left. Well, I've got, I think, six matches left. Actually, is that true? Might even have more than that, actually. I think we've got six or eight matches. I think it's six matches we've got left. No, you know what? I think it's eight matches we've got left. Really? No, you know what I think it is? We've got a ton of matches left just because there hasn't been a lot of chance to cast replays lately. We've actually been busy with a lot of other tournaments, um, which is a bit of a shame. But on the plus side, um, there'll be a lot of StarCraft. For us to cast tonight, we're going to cast at least two of these best of sevens. We're going to cast a third of these best of sevens. And I'm hoping that we get the replays from Crank tomorrow for the rest of this. And then we can cast it on um, Wednesday. Hopefully a good chunk more of it. Maybe not all of it, but we'll, uh, we'll deal with it. Yeah, look at this smooth FPS. Yeah, the big benefit as well of not casting it live is that we don't have to deal with the FPS lags. <laughs> Does anyone else think Wally's production is just so much better than Rifkin's because he casts from replays and the Korean server doesn't fuck him over? Yeah, I thought so too, actually. It's really beautiful. Yeah, it's insane, isn't it, Rif? Like, it's it's genuinely, like, still a thing for so many people. Like, the, the Russian casters were talking about it with this event as well. It's crazy. I'm impressed Crank got this team league to work. Well, Crank is very good friends with a lot of the Korean players, and a lot of them will, I think, in general, play in these sort of things for fun or just for the good of the scene and, you know, the good naturing of, you know, stuff. Obviously, there's a prize pool, but when you're splitting... I mean, first place, $1,800 isn't bad. I guess, I mean, I guess it's it's very low commitment as well, right? You show up for, like, maybe an hour or two a week, if that, for, like, three or four play days, and you get yourself potentially $600 once if you win the tournament. So, I mean, honestly, it's not so bad. My favorite part, though, is that the seventh place team gets rewarded as well. <laughs> it's like they get $27. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like such a, well, <laughs> you know, you guys tried. Have a McDonald's. <laughs> it's amazing. I love it. They get like $27 to split between the three of them. So they get $9 each. <laughs> it's almost like, guys, it's almost like, do you even need to PayPal me? God damn it. Alright, we do see this probe into the main base scan. We actually have got openings already underway, which we should maybe talk about. Uh, both players expanded here. I mean, Zest did have this uh, Stargate, so he goes into an Oracle. There is a good defense from Patience in the main base, though, so Oracle will not be all too successful just yet. Robo facility came up from Patience. A third gateway coming down as well. And we are just going to be seeing this Robo just going to be on its way up. Thank you so much. What would Gavin do with the 100 bits off to class? But hope you all enjoy some StarCraft. Thank you so much for the 100 bits, dude. I really do appreciate it. And as we do have the double Oracle now joining up together from Zest. And is going to be moving forward here to try and pick up a couple of probes. One probe goes down. Stalker in the center. He takes a little bit of damage, but not much. The oracles deflected. These oracles didn't do much at all then from Zest, but of course they will still stick around. They will still be good map control. And at some stage, there's probably going to be an open mineral line for some real damage to be dealt here. You can see that Zest still for the moment just looking for information more than anything else. Now those two oracles going to back away down toward the bottom right-hand side. 
Phalan drops down from Patience in the Natural Expansion and Adept as well. He's still setting up with this Robo Facility looking strong, but in general I just like it for Patience, right? I mean, strong start, nothing crazy going on. See this War Prism now coming down the right hand side. And is going to get set to uh, go in the next few moments. Oracle going to be chasing these couple of Adepts down. Actually, so that's something for Zest. We'll get a couple of kills here. At least gets one. The other is off and away off to the left hand side. Twilight Council and a Forge coming in from Patience. So those are just coming through here. Again, there's that Oracle which does get the kill. So another Adept going down too. Twilight Council drops in from Zest. His own plus one attack upgrade coming in. So he's a little bit ahead on plus one attack Zest. Going into some Phoenix, uh, that's cool, I guess, because there is this Warp Prism, right? And I guess he's kind of scared away the Warp Prism initially, but having a Phoenix means he can actually kill the Warp Prism rather than just scaring it away. So that's a pretty cool little something. It's a very low commitment to build one Phoenix. It's not cheap. It's not for free. It does cost a little bit of money, but uh, for, the, for the most part, I think it's a cool little uh, something to go for. As you do see, a Revelation drops on the Prism. Got those couple oracles just moving around in the center of the map. Some stalkers still just sat. We're in the main base. Temple archives coming in a little bit later again from Zess. He's just been a little bit late on most things this game, apart from plus one. And I guess charges at the same time too. No other great upgrades either. I guess the one advantage that Patience really set up for himself was the robot facility and the warp prism. But then the warp prism never really found anything here. Do you see Oracle's flying in for one, two probes. Now Zest going to go and hide away towards the upper left-hand side. And uh, again, just look for more damage here and there. I mean, it's just really nice to be able to keep doing this, picking off probes throughout the course of a game. Zest feeling brave enough to start up a third Nexus, something which Patience hasn't moved towards. Okay, he has moved towards it now, and he has started up. Okay, so both plays with the third base. And as we see Zest the first to continue into plus two attack, keeping that small upgrade advantage as the games continue. Again, Nexus just sitting on that third base as well. We're going to be seeing an Archon popping in here. I mean, both these players are just setting up into very similar armies. If you look at the overall graphs, I mean, Patience had a good while where he had an income lead, but Zest starting to take it more recently. In terms of the army size, you can say it's, see it's pretty even here between the two of them. The army size looking pretty good and not really anything too ridiculous. So, not expecting anything substantial to come of any fights or anything in the next couple of moments. It's not like someone's trying to hit a big plus two time and it's going to be like pew pew pow, you know, really beat the other guy up. Uh, Warp Prism drops some uh, High Temple and they feed back the Oracles, so the Oracles will be out of energy, but not dead. One thing Zest does have though is still that upgrade. The plus two is now halfway completed, and while being halfway completed, we're still talking about a Protoss player on the other side of the map who's yet to go into anything beyond plus one. So maybe Patience looks to do something with this, but I don't feel like he has anywhere near enough of an army advantage to take advantage of, oh my god, I didn't start one upgrade. Like, if he was 10, 20 army supply ahead, he could attack in pre-upgrade and then that upgrade something which has to spend money on, which is delayed him. But that's definitely not the case. Now we do have this Phoenix coming in, and well, actually starting to see the power of this Phoenix. He can chase this prism away. Also, I think Patience realizes that the rest of the army is elsewhere, and so he recalls home. Zest was getting ready to poke up here, but of course will not want to pressure into a fight before the plus two attack is done. Mortal being chased away to the right side. Zelda now going to start charging forward. Stalkers and Archons in play as well here as we're going to be seeing the initial waves of this. I kind of feel like Zest's Zealots have disappeared and now he doesn't really have much left over. Patience is going to keep on pushing through this and well, that plus two attack upgrade from Zest really did not do him any justice at all. It didn't really do anything in this fight. Patience just with a better arc on count going in. Just looked very good. Not even a better arc on count. He just killed two very quickly. He just had the better positioning because it was Zest attacking into Patience. And in the PvP attacking into the other guy without really much of an advantage. I mean, okay, you had a plus two upgrade over plus one. That's not a much as enough of an advantage in this circumstance to really make it work out. You need kind of like 10, 20 army supply more to really attack into people. Um, especially when they're just sat on their third base when there's choke points up into them. It's, uh, it's pretty rough, so not a good little fight for Zesty and Patience might be looking to capitalize now. Coming down to the bottom side of the map, getting ready to potentially push in towards the natural expansion. And Archon at the front is going to go down. Zelds will charge on forwards. Another group of Zelds going to charge in as well, and we are going to be seeing the rest of this just looking very good for Patience. Zest will not be able to hold on, and Patience is going to put Fiona and the kids on the scoreboard against Innovation One-Man Team 
GG from Zest, and Patience will take game number As you have got to the top right hand side, our Red Terran player, Bjorn. We actually have the two kind of the, the two players who are their teams are named after here. Bjorn and the kids, as Bjorn is in the top right, and the one innovation one man team with innovation in the bottom left hand side. Yeah, I think maybe my slider keeps slipping down. I'm gonna take careful note of where it is right now. It's that or my wire might be hitting my thing. I wanna get a new headset anyways, honestly. Like this headset really hurts my ears. Um when I got my new glasses, it really hurts my ears. So I'm gonna get a new headset sometime soon, just <laughs> You know when you wanna buy something but like you look at the cost of it and you're like, oh I really don't wanna spend any money. <laughs> That's kind of me right now of getting a new headset, even though I really should just get one. SCV coming across the map to see what's going on. A couple of SCVs on the way up either side, nothing crazy here. Hello Game TVT are going to be mirroring each other so far because they have both gone for the double gas opener. We're going to cancel that SCV, starts an orbital, will immediately throw down a factory. Innovations is not more than a second later. Let me just get this going to see uh, what's going to happen. Try different ear pads. Uh, it's it's not even it's not the ear pads though. I've tried multiple different. It just doesn't work. Yeah, it's a little bit frustrating, but all good. It's all good. We're going to come out and start heading across the map. What's up, Malax? Coming in with the Twitch Prime sub. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Takes an insured, you won't miss one tiny 600 euro Sennheiser headset. I think that's what I'm gonna get as well. It's gonna be freaking expensive, but I mean, worthwhile investment, right? Again, it's gonna be like my Christmas present to myself. I'm just gonna wait until I get my new setup, my new place, I think, and then spend a little bit of money here and there just to snazz it up a little bit. And then it'll also be nice because it'll mean I actually do have two headsets, um, which is kind of awesome, right? I'll have two different headsets to use. And yeah, it should be should be pretty neat. T Reapers and the Hellion heading towards the upper right hand side here, getting back towards the natural expansion as a little bit of a skirmish took place. Nothing too significant. That Hellion of Beyond took some damage. The early game TVT here on Blue Shift really just taking its time in terms of getting going. Nothing spectacular, nothing, oh my god, you know, nothing getting us screaming in these early stages. And as we have got Starboard, it's about to finish up on each side, and this really can be where the players start to diverge for the first time. Although, second Cyclone from Bjorn, and no second Cyclone out of innovation. He instead chose to build a Tech Lab. That's already a bit of a divergence here, and it is going to be Tech Lab, probably Cloak Banshee or Raven. Raven will be the choice, actually. So Raven from Innovation, while we see from Bjorn, he goes into a Liberator. So Liberator on the way up, and we are going to be seeing a couple of Cyclones, Hellion, and a couple of Reapers here from Bjorn, just setting up on the front of the natural. Thank you so much, Alas, for the $10 donation, says to help you buy the new headset. Thank you so much, dude, appreciate it. I think um, we'll probably do a little bit of a... We might do a bit of a donation goal off for it through December or something when we have the Christmas tree up. We'll call it Woody's Christmas present. Something like that. New headset for the stream. Seems like a reasonable thing to donation goal for. Thank you so much for the ten dollars. I appreciate it, dude. Give me some love in the chat. New sub, ten dollars. Beautiful start to the stream, guys. Thank you so much for the support. As you do see, Simpack is on the way up here from Innovation. Reactor. Gonna be used to build a barracks on top of and I mean, innovation setup is very defensive, right? The Raven, it can turn aggressive, but for now it's very defensive. It's sitting back, it's not pushing across the map. Like this army of Bjorn, Triple Cyclone, and a Liberator is all about getting in there and trying to deal damage. Tank Shot, though, is going to push those Cyclones away like they have no business here, which they kind of don't at this stage. As you see, pulling down to the south side, getting picked off as well. Here you go with this Liberator into the main. That's going to turn around and get sieged up, and sieges up on top of these SCVs, so SCVs are going to start going down. It's actually quite a little bit of damage being done at the moment, so 
That's uh, really nice. That's, uh, wow. Five, six, work is going down. Cyclone falls as well. Actually, Innovation struggling to deal with this. A couple of Marines finally get around the back of this Liberator Force. The Unsiege and the workers can get back to mining. That was a definitely a huge distraction. Bjorn didn't even really need the Cyclones at the front. As that Liberator, not only has it been a major nuisance, not only has it picked up eight kills, a Marine, a Cyclone, and six SCVs, it gets out alive. It's going to be heading back towards the right side, get repaired up, and it will be a bit of a bother once again here in this game. Just give it a few minutes to get repaired and back into position. Now we see Bjorn going into a Raven of his own, although he must remember that obviously Bjorn's Raven will have less energies than less energy than innovations for a little while here. These games have been cast from replay today, guys. They were played live within the last couple of weeks or so. Um, as we go through the day, we'll have more recent replays. It's it's simply just a matter of we've been very busy, and so we haven't been able to necessarily cast all the matches we wanted to maybe cast at first. As this Liberator comes up to the top, a scan from Innovation into the main base of Bion. Doesn't really show all too much as another Orbital Command just going to be morphing in over there, and again getting ourselves set up and going to tech lab, uh, Reactor actually onto the starboard. Both players are switching up into Bio style, the one thing I will say for Innovation He's very far ahead in this tech switch into bio, or this transition into bio. It's not really much of a tech switch, is it? But transition into bio, and that means that we already have Stimpak completed from him. And he's got plus one well on the way as well, though he will be behind on plus one armor. Altogether, Bjorn shouldn't be in too much trouble as long as Innovation doesn't kill him in the next couple of minutes. You know, if Bjorn kind of dies in the next two minutes, it's very possible with the lack of Stim, etc. This and that, the one plus one upgrade. But if he survives past then, the upgrades become very negligent in terms of when they started up and their advantages. And so we just do definitely see the, I mean, obviously Stim and so on. You only research Stim once in a game. It's not like you get level 2 Stim pack. In which case, you know, you be not be behind all game long, like with the plus 1 attack upgrades. So really the the upgrade difference is going to be very minimal here. As honestly, Bjorn has the number of uh, the Interfiend's Matrix to just shut this down, just to attack move into this. If he just uh, Interfiend's Matrixes the Raven, and but all three tanks, he could just attack in, and those tanks, I mean, then if he wants to, he can Matrix the Medivacs too to stop the lift up and then escape. Bjorn doesn't feel like he has the opportunity, though. Meanwhile, two Medivacs from Innovation will come through the center of the map, and we'll see what they can get up to, as the three Cyclones are actually going to spot this, just as the Medivacs start heading towards the natural. Looks as though Bjorn was maybe not paying enough attention, however. There's the Interference Matrix, he's coming down from both sides, older turrets as well. Innovation pushing in now that he's got combat shields, he's got stim combat shields and plus one attack all in his favor in this fight. SCVs are clumped up and Bjorn is going to be losing a lot of workers there. As that tank, well the tanks actually do get the tank kills there, although one tank goes down still. And the natural expansion, those SCVs took a bit of a beating as well as Marines came into the natural. They are now cleaned up also. Oh, this tank from Innovation comes towards to get the tank kill and he will get it and the Viking. Wow, a bit of a crazy little trait there. His innovation finds some real value out of these units. In the meantime, the Liberator got taken down. Didn't see it doing any more damage, though, so that's a good shutdown by Innovation, who doesn't allow Bjorn to get too much more done. Innovation's own third base now landed, morphing into an orbital. And with a seven worker lead and lead in army supply, Innovation is looking very, very good here at the moment. And as we do see Innovation moving across to the right hand side of the map to see what's going on. Obviously both players lost all of their tanks, so defensive positions are very weak compared to before. Which means that even without the Ravens, this is a very breakable spot. As we do see Scan coming down, couple tanks siege it up, Innovation pushing in. The tank will get to fire though. As SCVs take a couple shots, but none of them going down just yet. Innovation will stay backed away. Uh, just kind of happy to work his way through whatever these tanks can reach, which is a missile turret and then in towards a refinery. But time is ticking away for those tanks to fire because the Vikings are here. And that will push the Medivacs back, which takes away the extra vision they grant, and hence the ability for the Siege Tanks to utilize the entirety of their range. Marines and the tanks still gathering together for Bjorn. 2-2 two -two upgrades very far ahead from Bjorn. We mentioned he had a plus one armor lead, but he's turned that into a plus two, plus two lead now. Innovation just starting his 2-2. Two -two. And that could be something which Bjorn looks towards to get back into this with. He's still 12 workers behind as Bjorn will take a slight army supply advantage. So at this stage of the game, you, you got to kind of look at Bjorn and be like, okay, well, he's hurting, but he's not out of it yet. Definitely one of those situations where time is going to be ticking by, though. 
have to be a little bit careful as we do see a few of these Medivax Marines splitting up and going in a few different directions. Here we go through the top side as Bjorn gathers these Marines and Medivacs. Uh, okay, doesn't decide to go anywhere just yet. Now Innovation stems forwards. A Viking going to be taking a few hits. Marines going forwards there from Bjorn. Another Marine gets uh, shot from those couple of siege tanks, and you know, just going to be seen as this army from Innovation comes in from the left hand side, looking to try and push in towards this third base in the next few moments. A lot of Marines from Bjorn going to stem forwards, and actually, that's going to be Bjorn overwhelming both tanks. He actually missed a chance to uh, target that tank a little sooner, but he cleans this up entirely. He will be pushed into on the other side, but he can resume and get back in position to deal with that. Now some Vikings coming in to push the Medivacs away. He just needs to split these Marines a little bit, and those tanks will fall without too much damage dealt. And Bjorn is chasing for as much as he can get. And again, Bjorn just little advantages there going into the fight and innovation a bit too split up. And Bjorn just able to fight with the majority of his Marines in one location at a time, really allowing him to kind of overwhelm in those last few moments. Team Medivacs up to the top. Marines, Medivacs, a tank all coming through the south. See a few more Vikings showing up as well here from Dion. As we see another stem coming down. A couple of Marines already coming forward. Some innovation to greet these units of Bjorn. And while well, these Marines going to start working their way through the rocks up on this top side. So rocks on the top going to start falling. That's quite a bit of damage being dealt there. As we see a drop on the other side as well, though. I mean, all of a sudden, Innovation has a chance to maybe get some work of damage again. As if he's pulled in, but mostly just to buy time. It's now 2 2 upgrades apiece. Bjorn actually will not keep the upgrade lead here if Innovation starts his 3 3 now. Bjorn delayed his 3 3 by quite a margin, so has given Innovation time to catch up, but Innovation then still does need to get his own upgrades started up as well. Otherwise, he'll not really be going anywhere. Four Vikings sat up to the top. Plus three attack on the way now from Innovation. Two starports on the way out. And a couple more Vikings. So Innovation looking to switch this up into an air army. And Innovation still seems to hold the advantages. I mean, while he's been taking worse trades, you have to remember that Innovation has had the better economy throughout this game. In fact, if we get a moment or two spare, we'll have a look at those incomes throughout the game. And let's do that right now as Bjorn backs away. You can see that, yes, Bjorn five to ten minutes ago had a bit of an income lead, but then Innovation with the third base coming down has really dominated since then. And then the armies, yes, have obviously been Innovation a bit large, but taking some bad fights, especially that last one, not so long ago. But he's able to rebuild so much faster than Bjorn with 71 over 57 workers. Both of them have a fourth base coming up. I mean, Innovations is already mining, so that's going to be a big chunk of his income lead now. And you'll see his income is starting to kind of, well, dip down massively, which means that he's going to take a massive lead over Bjorn, as we do see Marines. Just going to be uh, coming through here. Innovation did get plus three, plus three starts, so as we mentioned. Bjorn had free free on the way, and he is now, you know, he did slow down a little bit, but and allowed Innovation to play a bit of catch-up, but Innovation was still, still then a little bit slow to continue his own upgrades. Tanks now pushing forwards towards this uh, right-hand side. This tank, probably in some trouble, probably will get taken down, you want to say, but somehow still survives. Planchy Forvis taking a few shots as well. Okay. Plus two vehicle weapons on the way up here now from Innovation. So getting that going, we do see more of these Marines and a couple of tanks. Going through the south side, tanks are once again going to be firing. And having a couple of tanks on the siege just as we see Bjorn stemming forwards. Innovation will turn to push that back. Still staying maxed out here despite all of this. I mean, his tank count must be so low. Four tanks against the seven. Let's see the plus three attack, plus three armor. About to finish up here from Bjorn. I see the plus two vehicle weapons on the way from Bjorn as well. Still on its way through here. And as we see those Vikings still just flying around in the skies. Bjorn coming through the center. Going to be looking to see what he can do. Comes in, picks up a marine nice and quickly. And this army of innovation is still pushing into the center. I mean, Bjorn doesn't have his advantage here, which is the siege tank number. He has free free, but the number of marines is just insane. I mean, Bjorn gave up a lot of marines to be able to build. I mean, they both have a lot of Vikings, but Bjorn really is lacking in marines. I guess that's just the work of difference that was in the game until recently. 
Vikings now getting a couple shots off on either side. This Raven kind of just gives itself up, doesn't really do much. Those tanks will be able to fire over this ledge here. Another Raven showing up from Innovation. I mean, anti-armor missile is what you expect to be used here. You get an anti-armor missile on those Marines and, well, minus three armor. All that work you've just done on upgrading is going to have disappeared for a few seconds. So, really creates opportunity as we see the Vikings are actually going to maybe get this third base killed off here. It's going to get very close. In fact, it is going to go down. Third base falls, leaving Bjorn down to three bases now. His fourth base is still standing as a plant tree, but now only two open for commands. He's missing out on mules, he's missing out on scans, and this puts Bjorn into a bit of a corner, even though it's Innovation who's actually kind of maybe surrounded a little bit here if uh, Bjorn decides to attack in. Bjorn just decides to send his marines across the map, leaving his tanks at home. So the marines going across the map, a couple of ravens here. Ah, uh, man, there's so many tanks here for Innovation, though, and those tanks are going to do a hell of a job. Anti-armor missiles as well, just to lower the armor on these Marines so that he can work his way through them a bit more easily with other Marines, but he needs to attack move rather than move command. These Vikings are now somewhat kind of just left in the middle of the map, and, I mean, everything's just everywhere. Innovation's pulling back, but he's going to find himself Viking kills for no real reason other than the is not controlling correctly. Engineering Bay is getting, well, high sec auto track. You're not sure how upset Innovation will be about that as we'll see these last few marines going down. Bjorn's counterattack is done with. Innovation lost 11 SCVs here, but no orbitals lost, nothing too major. Still holds the army advantage by about 30 or so. And this army coming through the south side is a couple more ravens on the way out. Plus one ship weapons. About to finish up as well. As you see these two marines just going to take that watchtower on the top side. Vikings getting rid of the Liberator tanks, we'll siege. Marines are going to stim into this planetary fortress, and planetary already down to about half health. A lot more SCVs going to be picked away at here. And those SCVs all going down, and Medivac as well. 17 workers killed at the same time, obviously starting to become a bit of a base trade, but Innovation is so much left at home in comparison to Bjorn. He has just a few Marines to really work with. Anti-armor missile hits on this side, which means already the few Marines in the front lines take some damage and interference. Matrix to slow down one of the tanks. Innovation pushing forwards again, anti-armor missiles expected to be used here, and boom, it goes off on an SCV, which was in the middle of those marines. Thanks for siege up again, that's a liberator picking off some SCVs as Innovation moves up towards the main. He's actually losing quite a few marines, he just wanders in towards siege tank fire there, which is a bit of a shame. Tanks are now in Innovation's natural. Tanks from Innovation will see jump to push this back as well, and he will be able to start killing off these marines, so it's only really tanks left over. On both sides of the map, Innovation though has still got his production in a comfortable position. Oh my god, he's got so many Marines actually. He just stims in and this should be probably a GG from Bjorn because now he's going to lose his counter-attacking force. He still is hit, pinned on the other side of the map. And he has not done enough damage to really scare Innovation at all here. Innovation looking very good is going to be seeing him, well, firing away. I mean, those units trying to break out as well. Some more turrets going down just to play help. And that's going to be GG. Innovation does take game number one. In a game which he really controlled from the earlier stages, but was not clean to close out. Uh, I wouldn't say any of the, you know, at any stage of this did innovation against Cess and innovation. Alright, well. Let's do this, guys. We kick off to the bottom right hand side. Remember, this is a best of seven. Bjorn and the kids only have one point and they sit in the bottom right. The teal and the blue. Gumiho and beyond. To the top left, it's going to be Zest in pink and Innovation in red. Now, most teams have generally put a Protoss player into the 2v2s. Protoss in 2v2 seems very powerful. The Phoenix is actually really, really good in 2v2. To kind of just like mass Phoenix while your opponent supports via the ground. There's some really interesting strats that we've seen. So we'll see what Innovation and Zest go for. While Bjorn and Gumiho will just go all out Terran Warfare on Zest and Innovation here and uh, see how that turns out for them. Again, I'm I'm not 100% hopeful, but uh, yeah, I'm intrigued, I'm intrigued. Maybe they can hit some kind of cool early game Terran attacks or something like that. Deck of cards for fortune telling? No, no, no. Deck of cards in my suitcase to play games, clearly. Command Center from Beyond. So Command Center, uh, Beyond will expand. And will be the first to do so in the game. It's a CC first from him. Gummy Hill not going to join him. He's going to go for the uh, 
racks and the gas in the early stages, so Yumiho is setting up with this, and a Reaper will start to come on out here. Because there's a CC first, Bjorn will be able to double racks behind this very quickly. He does not take gas, and he'll probably go to a third racks as well, and really just look to have a good amount of Marines in this early game. Now, usually you don't have a kind of a CC first against te other Terran players, because in a TVT, there's just so many ways to punish it and to get it, you know, to basically you fall behind. So as it stands, you know, in a TV2, I guess it works out, and it will give Bjorn and Gumiho a good amount of production early on. They'll have a lot of Marines. Obviously, not both of them needs to Reaper expand, because you only need one Reaper to scout. And there'll be Gumiho going for that scout and Reaper. Innovation with his own Reaper just popped out a moment ago, I believe. That already cancelled it for the reactor. No, it is out. I just couldn't see on the mini-map. This is a huge map, by the way. You need to like the tiniest little specks on the map. It's insane. Gonna have this uh, Reaper coming over towards the bottom right hand side. A little bit of a skirmish here. Somehow uh, Innovation got a shot ahead on the Reaper. I'm not sure how. But uh, all, all good. No one's really gonna kind of take any damage or anything. And the Reaper's back away. His expansions will be finishing up. Of course, Bjorn's the first to finish. But everyone else's were not too far behind in the work counts. Well, Zest is going to start taking a little bit of a lead because Corona Boost is a pretty powerful tool. And he's putting all of his Corona Boost into probes, probably realizing he can get a lot of workers up in this game. While his warp gate just sort of trails behind because he can rely on innovation to defend the early stages. Meal pulled away so it doesn't waste any excess of minerals by dying halfway through its final trip back to the command center. So now this Reaper of Gumiho does come in for full scout, sees the Oracle on the way, so gets the information that Stargate is down. Reaper is going to hop down to the low ground here, and will try and get the Mule, or at least force it off the Mineral Line for a second, but the Marines are pretty quick to show up. Will, in the end, uh, just Reaper grenade it to the side, and the Reaper will then die. Stimpak starting up from both Bjorn and Innovation, while Gumiho... You know what they could do is maybe if Gumiho played Mech and Bjorn played Bio? That could be pretty cool. In general, Bjorn is playing Bio, right? He's going Stim, he's got three racks very early, he's got the engineering base set up. Gumiho is going for the more kind of harassment heavy sort of setup. He's getting the, you know, the Cloak Banshee on the way up. He's getting ready to play a harassment based playstyle here. As you see this Reaper coming in. You see this, by the way, as well. Bjorn splits his Marines towards Gumiho's base, ready to help defend against the Oracle flying in. There's a missile turret in the natural, and in general, these guys are very well defended. As this Oracle flies through and will come in for a little bit more damage, get some Marine kill and a for SCV. Really great job so far, Zest. Will uh, get himself another SCV towards the end here, and will eventually leave with this Oracle as it runs out of energy. Another Oracle in the center of the map, just patrolling, watching if anything is coming across here anytime soon. And again, our first real harassment from Gumiho and Bjorn will be this Cloak Banshee, which is currently, well, the first one's just finishing up now. Obviously, still has to wait for Cloak, but that'll be done by the time it gets across the map, and so it shouldn't really waste any time moving towards the other left hand side. Again with a little bit of a laugh, I'm not sure what for. I think it was lost, maybe the adept went down. Not too sure. Anyways, two medivacs from innovation. Coming down to the bottom and getting ready to drop into Gumiho's main, and there is absolutely nothing in terms of defense in this main base at the moment. Uh, as we mentioned that, we talked about the Banshee earlier, it does show up now, but Revelation and Phoenix come in and just shut that down instantly. We mentioned Phoenix play earlier on, and that's immediately what Zest is heading towards here. And as the Medivacs get rid of a good few SEVs already, Gumiho taking a bit of a hit here. He's going to be, well, 14 workers behind Bjorn just to kind of put them next to each other and compare. So Bjorn and Innovation, 44 workers, 42 workers, but Gumiho on 32, that's a big loss for him. And so Zest is basically playing with a 20 worker advantage over a Terran player when you compare all of them against each other at the moment. Zest really just sitting back and macroing, macroing, macroing. Templar Archive is coming down to allow him to go in towards potentially some storms. Maybe he just goes straight to Archons. He is getting charged in a lot of gateways. Gimmihill still only on the uh, one factory. He's actually just massing command centers. Oh, is Gimmihill just going to feed Beyond? He's on quad CC. He's going to be playing mech, if anything, because he builds an armory. You know, an engineering bay, that could just be for whatever else. Armory will be for upgrades. And it's going to be plus one, plus one. There's actually two armories down. Huh. 
Where's the other one? There they are, they're right next to each other. That's why I couldn't find them, I was just not looking properly. Alright, well, two armory is down, double mech upgrades as innovation will come through the top side. Phoenix joined up with this drop as it heads across the right. Obviously, these players are now getting up towards their third bases. Beyond built his own location, Gummy Ho just floats over. He has this orbital. And again, this mech player really starting to get set up now. Innovation about to finish his own third base. Zest's third is already up and saturated. Gas is just now being taken. Marines unload over here as the revelation comes down. Another cloak banshee found and shut down almost immediately. And now we see Marines actually stimming forwards here. The siege tank will get taken down. No, it survives! An invasion getting ahead of himself. Zest maybe could have come in and lifted up the tanks. He doesn't find that opportunity now as we will just see. A bit of damage being done down here. Third base planetary for Gumiho, knowing that he has another orbital in the main. He doesn't necessarily need one more orbital down on this base. Just that extra little bit of defense, it can go a long way. Marines are still just moving around a little bit now and moving in the center of the map to see what is next. Plus two attack, plus two armor from innovation. More marines being produced on the barracks and all well, this entire army of innovation and zest now gathering together on the center. Still looking to be the aggressors here. If we look through the supplies of everything at the moment, innovation versus beyond is a 64-59 work game. In fact, Gummy Hill 58 workers too. Both players have 60-ish workers on Bjorn and the kids then. Army supply is a little bit down though from Gummy Ho, so it's definitely a much better army supply here from Zest and Inno. They're on about 110, while Bjorn and, Inno and Gummy Ho are about 100-ish. Well, they're about actually they're on 110 now, but then the other side is 125. So it's about a 15-ish army supply lead. But when you consider it's Terran Protoss versus Terran Terran, that's obviously very good. Now, obviously, one of the Terran players is playing mech, and that's worth keeping in mind here. But this army of Zest and Innovation is setting up in the center, and they might just feel that they have a chance to go for this in the very near future. They're setting up into the center, and, I mean, they continue to just expand down this left side of the map. I love it. Uh, you know, they went from you know Zest on the right to Zest on the left now. It's uh, kind of funky. I guess because these outer bases can be planetary fortresses, and so they're much more easy to defend, there's less need for a solid defensive structure on these bases here, which is obviously Zest bases. And I guess also if you want to recall a Zest, recalling to the far outskirts of the map is going to be a bit better than recalling over here into the center, because then you're even much safer from what you're recalling away from, or it's further distance to travel anyways, and so it's more justified for recall. There's a few different ways you can look at it. His Marines going to be stimming forwards and they're chasing down a siege tank. Tank sieging up here from Bjorn, but this is where this army of the Pros player comes into play. And that's an instant cancel from that command center. And we do see Zest leaving a few solids to the front here, probably to tank the tanks, uh, tank the tank shots as he runs into this right hand side of this third base. Going to be in some trouble. Here we go. Some force fields coming down. Storms are available. First storm drops very nicely. And Zest just well, still holding position over here. Innovation loads up in this center. I wonder if he thinks he can just drop forwards, or if he's just going to doom drop into the natural or something. He's going to drop his entire army somewhere. You can met, uh, I can uh, see that right now. Here we go. Comes straight into the main base. He's going to be on top of Gummy Ho's production. There's a tank or so in here, but nothing too crazy. A couple of oracles and Phoenix come into the main base as well. Meanwhile, the Zelds started to charge forwards onto this planetary forest. The supply demons are causing some concern, but there is going to be a planetary going down. As innovation in the main base, while well, like multi prong from these two guys is absolutely devastating as we're going to be seeing innovation continue to sim forwards Vikings going down, a tank goes down, Marauder, Hellions going down and this is looking as though we have got ourselves a GG on the horizon Zest and Innovation looking to take their team onto match point heading into the all kill phase which means there will be no revive available for Bjorn and the kids which means it will only be patience available to play in the all kill sector and if only patients can play in the all kill He's going to have to take down all of Innovation Zest and, of course, Sue, who has not been seen in this 2v2. There he goes. Zest and Innovation taking it and then out here once again. Now, he spawns in as the Blue Zerg player to the bottom left-hand side of the map from Asterion. Going up against the green Protoss player to the top right-hand side. This is Patience. Game 5 of this best of 7, Innovation 1-man team, aka Sue, in this game is one map away from closing it out for his team, while well, his patience has to win every map he can to get himself back into this. 
Adept going to be Chrono Boosted, and we'll continue to Chrono Boost that Adept out. Patience coming through the top side here, and just going to be shading across. A couple of Queens about to pop out. Ling Speed is going to be on its way very soon, and, well, it is on its way. It's going to be done very soon. Early game PVZ is looking rather regular in the first two or three minutes. Innovation did win against Bion in a 17-minute, 18-minute game even. It was a pretty good game, honestly. It was a pretty good game. It was enjoyable. I enjoyed it, at least. Hopefully you guys did as well. Phoenix Corona Bruce here from Patience. Going to be popping out in a few moments' time. And, I mean, at the same time, Link Speed's over halfway done now. A couple more Queens popping out. Wolf Gage is about halfway done as well from Patience. Let me just continue to get this uh, all set up right now as... Obviously, the Phoenix from the Stargate will get rid of this Overlord. There's another Overlord. This Overlord up here is interesting from Sue. I wonder why it is so far out on the map. What he was hoping to gain from sending it all the way up to the top side. I guess we'll maybe find out in due course. Bane Ness drops down from Sue behind the natural mineral lines, so... Actually, a fairly early bin in there's not overly not aggressive though, but it's just been a long time since we really saw kind of like a Ling Bane style kind of taking precedent in the CVP. And this isn't kind of Ling Bane, you know. Oftentimes with Ling Bane nowadays as well, it's kind of an early plus one melee, and then the Bane in comes into play a lot later on. I'm not sure if Sue's just afraid of some sort of weird play by Sue uh, by Patience, where there's going to be like a bunch of adepts or something, and he just feels like he has to prepare for that. But it definitely is not the case. It's just a robo facility coming in, and you know the Lings just see the Oracle now. There is a couple of adepts, but that should be dealt with very easily by Zerglings getting us around. Just the single Oracle means that the robo came down nice and quickly beyond this. And expecting, well, there it is, the Twilight Council to come down too. That very common combination of structures at similar timings here we can set up nicely in towards the Temple Archives for something like a Archon drop. Could just be straight into Charger this time around though as well. We'll see here very soon. Okay, so this is a few adepts. This is six adepts in total. Nah, I still don't feel this is all too scary. I mean, I guess there's only four queens, but that is somewhat because of the fact he kept mining gas and has got the money to make banelings at the moment. And a few banelings do start to build. Extra zerglings now on the way to you. Adepts will threaten to shade. As they shade forwards, they will see the banelings morphing, so now Patience knows that that is something to worry about here, and the shade will just cancel. Those adepts of Patience going to stay off over to the center. Temple Archive is dropping down from Patience 2. The Forge coming down also in the main base. Seven more drones on the way out. Plus one melee coming into play from Sue as well. That lair just coming up now also as we see these Zerglings continue to come across the map. A few extra Bailings just morphing in, getting ready to go. And yeah, everything looking, looking pretty good for the moment. This Temple Archives of Patience going to be finishing up. Observer from Patience on the way out of the Robo. Oracle will be able to target down one or two of these Balins now, so a little bit of damage being done. We do have the Queen's actually going to get the kill. I mean, for a couple of Banes, I wouldn't mind uh, killing the Oracle, though. I think Sue will be pretty happy with that. Well, here you go, the Archon dropped to the bottom side. Patience now looking to get a bit more damage done. This isn't an overly aggressive game from him, though. He's only just now adding on extra gateways after the third base is about to complete. You know, he's got the charge and the plus one just now starting. So it really is just these two Archons. He's not going to warp in any cells with this. Uh, but honestly, these two Archons against the Ling Star can obviously do very well. So he's doing all the right things, pushing the Warp Prism back with the Queens. And he actually even lets the Archons come a bit further forwards again here to maybe draw the Prism back into play. I guess the Prism a little bit lower, but still a long way from being killed off here. Patience for the moment. He's very, very safe with his position. I don't think there's any real concern for Patience at this stage. Did you see some Ling's going to come in and wrap it around again? And it looks as though... Those Archons will continue to. I mean, these Archons are having a really good time, actually. Do you, you see Lings <laughs> forcing the Archons to lift back up? Man, this has been pretty exciting, hasn't it? And we see plus two melee now on the way from Sue as well. Groove Spines coming in on the Hydralisk den. More Hydralisks on the way out. Lings and Banes going to split off to the right-hand side. A couple of things going to go across the map as well to see what is going on. Creep spread will go in two different directions, some up the left or up to the top, and some off to the right-hand side also. 
Some good stuff so far. Patience. This entire team of Bjorn and the kids, I obviously we see Gumiho a lot, but Patience and Bjorn, two players we don't really see all that much of, which is uh, kind of amusing as we do see Archon's going to come in and a Hydra's being pushed away. I mean, transition in this into Ling Bane Hydra is unsurprising from Sue. While we don't see it all the time in ZVT anymore, Hydra's are still pretty good in the ZVP. As this has turned into quite an aggressive play from Patience now. He is committed to this and he's warping in units again and again. Bane Speed finishes up and the Bane's actually going to get some good connections so while the 4th base will drop, the Bane's will now have some good shots to get something done. Workers went down on the other side of the map as Bane's came crashing in during this fight. So 9 probes were lost and Sue down a hatchery but holding on here, holding on might just be all he really needs because if he can hold on, he might be able to turn this into something special still. Another few Zealots warping in. Good will be coming out to the left hand side here as we do see Archon Zealots. Coming into play, a couple more Lings and Banes continue to push on forward. Zealots charging through and, well, the Banes actually get some pretty good connections there. More Zealots dropping down once more. These Archons will be established, uh, left on their own though because the Prism goes down mid-warping. Well, 20 drones go down and Zealots go to the left side, which is painful. But it looks as though this is pretty much going to be it. As you see, these Zealots going to get picked off and that is going to be... The end of this attack from Patience, he loses everything bar an Archon and a Zealot and the, and the Phoenix. Wow. So while that was a lot of damage done by Patience, you got to really realize that he took a lot of damage himself in terms of the army. But still, Sue is down by 16 workers, down a hatchery from where he would want to be. Welcome comes back over to the right side, going up to the top of Zealot. Going to be seeing what's up there. Love Lord just sat up here as well, and a couple of shield batteries currently just on the way down, added onto this fourth base nexus. I think just runs on in and just comes in to start working his way through that shield battery, so a little bit of damage being done. Another Zealot going to be picked away at here. Uh, some, some good damage being done in general at the moment, as we do see. My Templar continue to gather. A couple of Zelts going on to that fourth base. So you see the Zelts in the main base. Well, trying to get something, but the War Prism gets shut down. Another little win for Sue, who is having to play the comeback game at the moment. He's definitely behind. I guess he can make a bit of... He spent his money. I guess the game evens out a little bit. And he is getting up to a fourth base. They both have a plus two upgrade. Sue starts 15 more drones. In a way, it kind of feels like Patience should keep being aggressive because when you've put the Zerg under so much pressure, when you've shut down a hatchery, you've shut down workers, and you haven't really taken damage yourself, you know that they have to stop unit production to rebuild from what they've had, or what they've just lost, right? So that's obviously a pretty big deal here. Yeah, a few probes just went down, actually. You know, that was really dumb of me. The probes went down and I was like, huh, that's interesting. And I thought it was the Prism over here killing drones. I, I, I'm not going to lie, that was just really stupid. I thought it was the prism over here killing drones, which is why we went to look at it. But instead it was the probes going down and I'm just like, oh my god, what a failure. Sorry guys, that's me going completely terrible. Apo apologies. Um, just my, my mind playing tricks on me. A couple of storms here to stop these veins hitting too much into the mineral line. Still more full wall probes going down. It's going to be seeing the Zelda's arc on setting up. More storms ready to go as well. Patience getting ready to push on in. Oh, he just sets up down at the south on the bottom right. A few Zelts, they get cleaned up pretty quick as well. Here we go then. Main army starting to push forwards. I kind of feel like Sue's got enough though. I mean, obviously the storms are good if they can connect, but... Well, we'll see. A few more Banelins on the way in. Those two storms aren't really that great either. Patience starting to run out of those. And now in a position where this could come in from the right-hand side as well. And Sue could kind of, well, begin to surround this a little bit. Still feel Sue needs some very good Bane connections to make this work out here. There's a Bane that's going to hit all of the High Templar, which brings them low. They move into Archons. On the top side, the High Templar going down as well. Now there's only a couple of Storms really left over. Which is a bit of a shame. Queen being pushed away by these few Archons again. No Bane's rolling forward here. Hydras and Ling is trying to come on through. Queen taking some damage. Patience with a few more Zelts, a few more High Templar just warping in, getting this ready to go, and we're going to push forwards in towards this third base, so 
Well, Hydra's going to attack on into the top side. These Hydra's taking a little bit more damage as well. Lings will keep on flooding through too. A few Banelings connecting in on these Zealots as well. And Wow, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell, right? There's only really a few Archons and an Immortal left. Another wave of Zealots warping in. Ten more Hydra's in production. As Sue will have to pull drones to stay alive, but the Hydra's are starting to deal some real damage here. And Immortal at the front is also going to go down. Some extra Zealots taking some damage as well. The War Prison tries to warp in, but decides not to because in range of the Hydras, it's dangerous. Patience is pu pushed back, but once again, Sue loses 13 workers here. And that are some big, big losses. So some big losses going in. Suddenly, uh, Sue is down on workers yet again. Army supply trails for Patience. Prison will just be healed up by Shield Barry. Four more gateways on the way out in the main base. There's Bane's Hydra's all over this coming up the left hand side. Hydra's still moving around in the center of the map as well. A couple of zealots in the bottom right will run on through and then we get themselves a drone. Another zealot picked off there as well. A zealot down here to the south side, surrounded and killed. 18 more zerglings in production. Four more gates still, as we mentioned before, coming up. Medium of patience will really have a real stream of units for uh, Sue to deal with very shortly. 14 minutes into this PVZ and Sue has multiple times been set behind. I again just kind of feels like it's this point where Patience should keep up the pressure once more. I guess as he heads home, he waits for High Templars to gather some energy, maybe a few Immortals to join the fray. I feel like a second robot wouldn't really go amiss for him, right? Just to rebuild that Immortal count. When you have five bases, it seems kind of affordable. And rebuilding two Immortals at a time really speeds up the process of just the rebuild after these fights. And these fights are pretty, you know, Pretty significant as they get uh, cleaned out again and again, both armies. Flingles getting another quick surround. Top left hand side, a few Zelts going to be running by as well, and Patience just going to try and see what he can do with those. This pylon from the front also. Still just set up. 20 more Banelings currently morphing in from Sue. With a few more Zerglings coming in alongside that. And here we go. Lings are going to start running in just around those Zealots. And those Zealots are in a lot of trouble. So Zealots will go down. And as the Zealots go down here, we still have Sue just continuing to come across to the bottom right. Again, another couple of Zealots going to get picked off. I mean, suddenly Patience feels like he's just bled away units for the last few moments, like Zealots around the map not really doing very much. Now he's pushed with an army that doesn't really look terrifying at all. Two Archons, two Immortals, and two... <laughs> two Zealots and two High Templar. It's like he's trying to go into Noah's Ark or something over here, Patience. It's uh, not quite the trite timeline, buddy. And uh, his army is obviously... he's got more of it to the top side. And I was going to say, like, he has to have something somewhere. As uh, he does come up to the top side. But has to be very cautious here because Sue's army, if he just jumps on this, I mean, that's a good chunk of supply he'll just pick up basically for free. Now, obviously, the storms can do some damage, etc. But, well, let's see as we have Sue's uh, green starting to run in. And, I mean, what's Patience looking at at this time? He just loses this. I mean, the storms didn't even go off. That was the one way he's going to deal some damage here. Sue making some pickoffs lately that really starts to bring him back into this. Even if he is still down in work as... Zelts do get the bottom side base, so again, Sue denied a 6, but well, let's see what Sue can do with the next fight, because I feel like if this next fight goes well for him, there's some real opportunity for him to end this game, and I feel like there's some real opportunity for this fight to go well for him. As the Zelts will be looking to lead a charge in here, but it's really just not that many Zelts, is it? Here you go, first storms are very good. Obviously, Lings and Banes just melt the storms, and usually you can't really keep up with just Ling, Bane, Hydra. Usually you look for a transition, but it's not happening this time around. A transition from the Protoss, though. Carriers and the Mothership in production. All of this coming through. But now we have, well, Sue in two different sides of the map. He's going to be attacking into the top side. He's going to be pushing through the south. And, I mean, those High Templar, they actually don't have... Okay, they do actually have Storm Energy. Two Storms. I mean, one Storm would have done the job there. So little things like that. Wasting more Storms than they needed. Little things like that really will start to cost patience here. As we see now, Sue's going to congregate on the top side. And suddenly, these High Templar are being surrounded. One goes down with storms available. The rest will go down as well with only one storm dropped. And what a disastrous fight on the top from patience. That's what you can do to the right-hand side as the carriers show up. 
I think the answer to that is not really all that much. Interceptors are being taken down very quickly. The carriers will not be doing any damage at all in a moment or so. As these hydras are just going to be enough to keep on fighting. Zealots go down very quickly here. Archons coming forward to try and help, but they go down pretty quickly as well. Suddenly these carriers have zero interceptors on them. As Sue will push on through. And Patience makes too many mistakes to close out the game. And Sue will close it out for any.